Okay, are we all ready? Yep. Okay, all right. here we go. Hello? Hey, Grandma. This is Mike. Yeah, I was on the phone with Danny right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that explains it. Yeah, we were trying to call you. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to call you on your cell phone? Well, this this is okay. Like, just I'm uh, sitting in my lazy boy now. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. Nice. So I have me and all of my friends here on the call. So I'm I'm going to remind you of their names. So you guys say hello when I announce your name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we've, we've got Matt. Hello. Hello. We've got Landon. Hi, Mrs. Noko. Hello. Hello. And Ross. Hello, Mrs. Noko. <laughs> Hello, how are you? So, Grandma, they all listened to your interview that you did about a year ago. They thought it was great. Yeah. Matt Matt didn't even know what the depression was before he heard it. <laughs> oh, he didn't. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He does. He did. <laughs> Oh yeah, so, kids, in in those days, the kids learned that uh, you could you put so much on your plate and you eat that. Right, exactly. Yeah. You don't put all this food on your plate and then say, "Oh, I don't want no more." I know, and that's what I learned growing up. So, unless they were onions, obviously, then I wouldn't eat those. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to have help. Uh, onions on hamburgers. <laughs> right, right. I've heard that before. I've heard that before. So, <laughs> Grandma, tonight's episode is not about the depression, but I told you earlier, it's about, um, well, it's about a speech from the TV show Everybody Loves Raymond. And you, yeah. I remember you used to watch that show, right? Yeah, I, I, it's hard to remember what exactly took place. <laughs> but yeah, I used to watch that. So I'll give you a quick refresher. Remember there was Ray Romano and Deborah. Ray sort of had a big nose, dark hair. He was sort of like a dopey husband who couldn't get things right. Does that refresh your memory? On I guess so. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Okay. So, <laughs> so Do you realize sort of... how old I am? <laughs> yeah, these guys know. We all, we all know you just turned 96 or 69 as you like to say on me oh, wow yeah uh, I'll, I'll take it backwards <laughs> i don't know what happens when you'll turn 99 because that's still 99 the other direction <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i don't want to live to be 100 well you'll probably hang in there who knows <laughs> <laughs> So, Grandma, like I just said, um, here's here's maybe a different fun question that maybe you'd like to answer in, as you sort of, like, introduce us here. Since Everybody Loves Raymond was sort of like a dopey husband, not really good for much except telling jokes, is there is there a fun story of, like, Grandpa being particularly generous or kind with helping around the house that uh, that you remember? Well, your grandpa would always help around the house. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, um, he he did the, help me with the dishes, and he'd mop the he'd wash the floors all the time. Oh yeah, I remember him washing the floors. You know, and uh, later on, uh, when I had a hard time dusting the baseboards in the house, and that your grandpa would dust them. Mm hmm. Right for me. Always a clean house. Still a clean house. Yeah. And when I'd go to the hospital to have one of the little kids, your mom or somebody, by the time I got home, your your grandpa would have the kitchen floor scrubbed and my clothes washed and everything. <laughs> yeah. So. you And you had four of those little kids. So it was at least four times that he did all of those things. <laughs> Yeah, I had four little ones. <laughs> <laughs> so, great job, Grandma. Fantastic job. Well, yeah, I enjoyed this. I was waiting for your call. And in the meantime, uh, uh, I was talking to um, uh, Dan. Uh, uh, Doden's birthday. Oh, Dodi. Oh, Colton. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, Colton's, Colton's birthday. birthday. I called him. Yep. He, he uh, called me. And thank me for his card and his money. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know. And then I was talking to their da his daddy. And I told him, I said, there's getting to be so many grandchildren in that now. 
I have to kind of cut my money down. <laughs> yeah, that happens. That happens. I remember I when I remember years years ago when I only had one or two grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Grandpa would put fifty dollars in it. Yeah, but uh, well, that that's okay for the rest of the grandkids. But don't cut me short. All right. <laughs> well, I had a I had a cut them all short because um, it it kept increasing. Sure, sure. You know, I got, well, that's all right. So long, I, so long as you don't cut your love short for us. No, I love you guys. I uh, I keep cut, uh, call, uh, counting them, like I think number sevens do in a couple of days. That's right. Yeah, Robert and Sarah, they sure are. They sure are. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. Grandma, you did a great job setting listeners up for the show. Thank, thank, thanks well, for doing this. Well, I enjoyed talking to you guys. <laughs> Can you guys give one more goodbye for Grandma? Goodbye. 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 Thanks, Mrs. Tinoco. Good night, goodbye. Grandma. Goodbye, and Love behave you. yourselves. <laughs> you <laughs> okay. too. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. When you see the road from every direction, it will give you eyes, give you hope. It'll give you perspective I've been back and forth And yeah, I had my crashes Now I've seen the road It goes every direction Tonight on the show, we got the full crew again. Sadly, not the Dust Girls did a fantastic mm -hmm. job. That video is available now, or that podcast, but... Logan Free, I mean Landon Free, is back in the United States. It's Logan. Great to have you Thank back. Thank you. Thank you. Great to have you back, Thank Landon. You. Tonight's episode, third speech in the Speeches by Mom series. This one comes from Deborah Barone, played by Patricia Heaton in the Everybody Loves Raymond series. This was one I watched growing up. Um... I started watching the show again recently, just like randomly, you know, on cable at a hotel for the evening or something. And it struck me just how much of like a jerk that Ray is. And then I also like saw in these other th shows like King of Queens, whenever that was on. I have somewhat recently rewatched Father of the Bride with Steve Martin. I'm like, these guys are such butts, yeah, like almost example. to the extent that it's like not even funny. <laughs> so it sort of just made me think a little bit like, how did that come to be, right? So if you sort of imagine like spectrum of change for dads and moms and husbands and wives from first kind of popular television, like Father Knows Best, Leave it to Beaver, you know, you can sort of picture what those dynamics look like. The Dick like, Van Dyke Show. To Dick Van Dyke Show. I didn't watch that, so I really can't picture it. It's really good. It, but, Andy Griffith is um, my boy. Andy. To the 1990s, 2000s, where he got, yeah, Everybody Loves Raymond, King of Queens. Um... Then to modern day, I don't think any of us really watch a whole lot of popular TV anymore. But we, we can maybe speculate. I we <laughs> um, Any references for modern day couples comes from Girl Meets World. Um, <laughs> since I'm a huge Boy Meets World fan, I did admittedly watch some of the show in order to just get a sense, sense of where things are at. So that, that's the spectrum. So when I expressed this idea, the 1990s sitcom mom-dad dynamic, was that something that you guys had like thought about before? I've definitely reminisced on how good TV used to be. Uh, yeah, maybe it's just what you grow up with you think is the best. But I even remember, I don't know, we our, I think our dad bought like a DVD package of the Dick Van Dyke show. And we, we watched like all of those episodes and, and they were great too, even though they were black and white and super old. Um, but yeah, I think modern comparisons, everything is so niche and there's not like everybody watches kind of what they want to project onto themselves. And there's no longer like a broad American yeah. spectacle. Um, I, I, no, that's not true. I think um, 
This Is Us probably hit that. There, there might be a couple, but they're like the exception now, not the rule. Whereas, you know, the rule used to be you had several of these every year. Um, Dick Van Dyke was from Illinois, wasn't Danville, he? along with that's um, right, yeah. Dick Van Dyke's appliance yep. store. Ross, Matt, any uh, 1990s, 2000s family sitcom pillars that sort of provide a reference point for this uh, idea tonight? Honestly, I think uh, I think Everyone Loves Raymond was kind of the show for our family for a while. My parents always preferred that to friends, especially for us kids. Um, they're just a lot more uh, wholesome sorts of things developed. Uh, amidst Ray's uh, and I would say Deborah's shortcomings too. She's not perfect, uh, but uh, but yeah, no, I would say that, uh, that show I thought was was probably one of the most watched shows in our household. Um, yeah, I mean there'd be a handful of other just kind of general family sitcom things that would happen to be on, but yeah, I'd say that was a big one. Yeah, we were not allowed to watch Friends in my house. And I've actually attempted to watch it since then, just like out of curiosity. I can't watch it. That show is so dumb. Now, you know, to like provide a little bit like clear to like, I, I don't want to like make it out that like everybody loves Raymond as like a bad show or like inappropriate because admittedly, I've been watching some episodes on DVD this week as I like get the speech that we're pulling the clip from. But I feel like there should be, like, a big asterisk, like, next to it. Like, you know, like, Spotify puts the COVID-19 blue banner on <laughs> and episodes talk about that. that that's sort of what everybody loves Raymond needs. Um, and we've brought up COVID on our episodes. We haven't gotten the blue banner yet. Maybe there, <laughs> there's, there's a certain number of times you have to say it. So, okay, Ross family sitcom pillars um of the ones you listed at least from that era none were like huge as far as watch all the time i would think of the ones you've mentioned so far king of queens was probably the most commonly watched um i actually did watch a lot of friends like through high school and stuff i just thought it was funny um <clears throat> but i feel like for our family we were maybe more into some of like the older comedy ones like i don't know like in high school you could like watch what was it nick at night or whatever they might have reruns of like Gilligan's Island or like I Love Lucy and like shows like that. Um, so I feel like those are probably more of the shows we watched. Um, we watched, I, mean, I remember like still my parents would watch like MASH reruns or something or um, what's the other one? Coach. That was a show I actually really liked to watch actually. So I feel like even when then maybe like those, show, those shows had passed, but we kind of watched those and they were still maybe a little more readily available than they are now. Um, but yeah, as far as the current ones, I watch, like I said, Friends a lot, but as far as like our family, I think King of Queens is probably the most commonly watched one. Ross, defend Friends for Mike, or do you just go along with his... I don't have a lot of, I mean, I think it's funny. Um, I mean, lots of inappropriate humor and not a lot of like, it's not the family wholesome show that fits into like, I feel like the genre we're kind of talking about. Um, I think there's a lot of funny parts in Friends. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> let's uh let's cut to that speech here, um, in order to sort of center us. So the speech comes from season seven of Everybody Loves Raymond. Context is Deborah and Ray are getting dressed for Robert's wedding to Amy, and. Uh, Deborah has left Ray to get himself dressed and ready to go. And she re-enters the bedroom where he's getting ready. And we will play that clip from there. Boom. <laughs> Stupid weddings. Here they are. Aren't they beautiful? go i showered did my hair got the kids up got them dressed kids go downstairs mommy's yelling and you can't even do yourself what i'm ready everyone is waiting for you oh, look at this look this goes on after the pants einstein here okay. do you realize that it is a it's a three-hour drive to pennsylvania amy is waiting for me robert is in 
nervous wreck. I mean, come on. Hey, 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 hey. You might be a little too angry to do the zipper. What have you been doing? I got the speech, the frickin' toast thing I gotta do. Would you stop obsessing about the toast? Just say something funny and heartfelt. Nobody cares. I wanna know why they're getting dressed for a three-hour drive. They should have gotten a hotel. If you got... I, people didn't get hotels all the time. <laughs> Why did you choose this scene? You know, I wanted a scene that just like captured and succinctly, yeah, succinctly captured the sort of like dynamic that we're getting at here. The dopey husband and the wife who just has to do everything. And I felt, I mean, the scene's only 35 seconds long and I think that it, it clearly captured that. Um... So, I mean, I guess a good way to sort of segue into the meat and potatoes of the episode here is, you know, I'd allude to earlier of how, you know, 1950s, 60s television, you know, it clearly has that image of the, yeah, I mean, just the title itself, Father Knows Best, right? <laughs> like, clearly implying that the man's in charge. And, you know, everything sort of flows out from there. Obviously, no dopey husband going on there. So, how did we transition from that to... And obviously, Everybody Loves Raymond is not like an island. You know, we reference King of Queens, The Simpsons, Family Guy. It's, it's a lot of different things going on, right? From power hero dad to dopiness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Part of it probably is capturing something in the culture that's going on. Um, I don't think that all of these TV shows that portray the similar dad are just like, you know, they didn't make it up out of thin air and like, oh, we'll make up this kind of overweight, chubby, kind of lazy, sits on the couch and drinks beer after work type of guy. Um, like, I think that they probably are something was changing with men or maybe yeah something was going on that that was an actual thing i think people maybe maybe exaggerated a little bit but i think that a lot of men probably did were kind of the dopey husband at least in a way and then the shows probably you know exaggerated it to kind of make their point and make it funny um but i would i would think that it probably comes from somewhere at least start somewhere real that was something going on um whether it had been going on for a long time or it was a new phenomenon, but um, that would be my first thought. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's on point, what you said there, Ross, about exaggeration. Because yeah, it is like important to remember that, I mean, in both circumstances, 1950s, father knows best type television. It's like, I mean, even that is an exaggeration of reality. You know, it's women, I'm speculating, mansplaining here. It's like, I mean, it seems, you know, women have always found, not just women, but anyone who seems to have less authority in a particular position, like, finds ways to, like, have control, right? I mean, that's just, like, human nature. Um, yeah, in the same way with, like, this, it's like, yeah, is there truly a real-life Ray Barone? Mm, I mean... If someone really were like that dopey, like, I'll, well, they'd probably be divorced by the time that the show was on after so many years of marriage. No, I think there's tons. I think there's tons. And they're not divorced. They're not divorced. Like, like it's, it's real and it still, you know, it still works out. How, how real, though, is the question? How much can a real life Deborah Barone tolerate? How much should I mean, how she much, tolerate? How much oh, divorce that's is fair. there in the that's world? Fair. You know what I mean? Like people getting divorced yeah. all the time. To- like, like yeah. one, in, yeah, one and two. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I could definitely see things like this, and even th- like, especially in a world where we're, I mean, people are delaying marriage longer and longer. Um, I think there are a lot of couples who live together like that for a while and then eventually break it off. For one, you know, who may have gotten married earlier, on, you know, in, in previous generations, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think it's yeah. pretty, I think there's something going on. Um, 
Yeah. But I also, I also think that just in a world that's like seems to be post virtue, you know, we're not really interested in that culturally anymore. Uh, I think just relatability is king, right? So like people don't want, um, mm. I feel like there's not as, I mean, yeah. Hollywood TV shows are there to, to sell the people, uh, at the end of the day, um, and entertain, like it's not purely, um, money driven, but, um, but yeah, like people I think have more of a taste for relatability, um, as opposed to like someone to look up to or someone to you know emulate their life after so i feel like there's an element of that too so it's not just like the cultural representations because i think there's probably been dopey dads who've had bad like there have been bad dads and bad husbands for all of history you know um they look different now i think than maybe previous generations but um but yeah i also think there's more of a, a taste in the public for just like relatable relatable characters as opposed to like true true yeah mm, yeah that's an interesting point relatability which is if you go deep into your literature classes is like the difference between modernism and postmodernism like at some point at one of the ways to define that is like do you realize the context in which you're existing and and therefore it's like more real or it's more aspirational and as you get closer to postmodernism it's like well we know what we're doing here so why even try to like paint a facade on it or to be like perhaps virtuous or perhaps aspirational it's just let's barely describe what's going on now and maybe that's as good as we can do yeah, I mean, just to put a fine point, my word I like. Yeah, I mean, the aspirational is the facade, right. yeah, right that year, yeah, yeah, but still like worthy. I mean, but I think the relatability thing. I think the reason that's important is because it addresses a little bit of that like aloneness of like that's a consequence of like nihilism or nihilism, mm-hmm. if you will. I think so. I, yeah, I think that might be like the core tenant or core value there, Russ. No, I mean I can't same ballpark of what you guys are talking about. But I think, like in that idea of like relatability versus you know virtue, virtue, like how you're going to portray something. I don't know. I I mean I still strike that book, uh, Covey Stephen Covey's Seven Habits Highly Effective People. You know I read that in PT school and so much of that still like pops into my head today. But um, one of the things he talks about in the book is like. You know, for some reason, we want part of us, not not the good, like, best part of us. Like, you almost want other people to not do well or almost, like, are slightly happy if they don't um, simply because you're always putting yourself in competition with them. So it's hard to see, like, a win-win mm-hmm. scenario. It's kind of a, you know, if they're winning, I'm losing. That's kind of how we tend to think about things. Um, so I feel like it's kind of the same thing. Like, you would hope that if you saw somebody doing things really well, you would be inspired by that person and want to be around that person and kind of you know like let them make you a better person but i kind of think the other way is when we see people do things really well too often the uh temptation is to start looking for their faults and kind of or making them up but you know just kind of not kind of taking the opposite route um instead of letting yourself be built up is starting to try to tear the person down so i think that a lot of people would see television in that way and then kind of like the relatability, it's like, you know, if, if if this person's a dopey husband, it kind of gives me, in a weird way, like, permission to do so. It's not a bad thing anymore if that's what everybody's doing. Um, yeah. So I think that there's something to that probably of, you know, just from the man side of things, like when you're watching TV, um, you know, you want to feel good and relax. So, like, people would probably prefer to, you know, see somebody that, is dumber than them to make themselves feel better as opposed to somebody that when you get out, stop watching the show, it's like, man, I really need to go do the dishes or something. Mm. Um, that's just not when people sit down and watch TV in the evening, probably what they are looking for, I think. So what's the, the question we're grappling with is what, again? Backtracking related. Oh, 
Yeah, exactly. Just explaining the the chasm between Father Knows Best and... Slightly tangential, I'll try to bring it home with some some background of it. So... What? Go ahead. Just, like, trying to keep things tidy here. Try something new here. So explaining this chasm between Father Knows Best and Everybody Loves Raymond, we've uh, we've identified um, one is exaggeration, sort of playing a role, right? Neither circumstances are completely reflective of reality, for one. And two, in a changing of what an audience is perceived to value in media from some kind of noble hero, aspirational hero to a recognition of postmodernism as Landon expressed it, that basically aspirations in the most objective transcendental way are an illusion or a facade or colonialism. So therefore, the only real thing that we can pursue is relatability. And then I suggested that that is an antidote to nihilism. Okay. I would still like to try to answer that question with some info. I would. No, yeah, I would you be can't curious keep though. More, but... So '90s sitcom father figures, Ray Romano, little slouchy in our opinion. What about? Tim Taylor in Home Improvement. Right, I saw, you know... C- compare compare Tim Taylor to Ray Romano. Like, just, what's there? What's going on? Okay, Ray, author, writer, artist, Tim Allen, Tim Taylor, you know, works with his hands. He's creating physical things. He's building Detroit. <laughs> Someone else can go. Ray Romano, neighbors are his parents. Tim Taylor, neighbor has <laughs> eyes and a forehead. <laughs> um, oh, oh, here's an interesting one. Tim Taylor, his children play a significant role in the show. Hmm. Ray Romano, no. They're... Sure. No, that is a good point. They don't do anything. <laughs> I have not watched a lot of home improvement because ross was just watching friends <laughs> yeah. he's one of the cheap laughs i have watched a lot what. of his new show though last man standing and i actually think that's pretty good yeah it's the 20 I'm, i think it's 2015 kinda, version of it and they remade yeah. it probably a little bit but it's yeah. good home improvement is really good um i i was uh i could i'll just maybe get to the point if we want to dwell on it more we can i do think i would I feel like all of the shows like always have kind of a resolving like there's a fight, there's an argument, one side like lets their griefs out to the other, um, they go vent and they come back and it does get resolved. I do feel like everybody loves Raymond has that too. I know Home Improvement does, but doesn't yeah. it come full circle in Everybody Loves Raymond too? Where like they sort learn of, something or sort not? Sort of. Less so. It's more. I don't know. There's just so I much mean, of I, it. I don't know. I do remember there being a lot of, like, I don't know, res, yeah, resolution moments or, like, yeah, like it's not like Ray grossly develops in virtue by any means. He has the same, like, idiot <laughs> tendencies, like recording the Super Bowl over his wedding video and, like, whatever other dumb yeah. things he does. But, like, uh, I don't know. He definitely cares, you know, and he struggles and um i don't know like i yeah he definitely cares he's sincere if not incompetent um which like yeah isn't great like you don't want he's at least sometimes sincere I yeah question. no that's true that's true he's not always sincere yeah. Yeah. um well i did watch a little background of how the creators of home improvement came up with it um and i thought it was like an interesting context for just describing the cultural moment they were in. Um, First of all, Jeff Katzenberg and Michael Eisner, high ups at Disney, like discovered Tim. And then when they like, they used a book for their reference and Iron John was the book, just like men being men. Um, And basically like men since the industrial revolution were lost, you know, the agri in the ag community, you work side by side with dad. So in the show, they're going to have three sons 
basically like learning from dad, working side by side with him in the garage, primarily in that context. Um, Cause house all day, you know, who's there to teach you to how to be a man. Um, so some of the thesis for the show was like, they're, you know, they were going to have the woman and Tim out, Tim Taylor, Patricia, I think was her actress's name. Um, it's like they believed or as they thought about it, they're like men and women can't live together. So what holds them together um, was basically like love and being a functional family. And they went out to produce a show that they just wanted to show um, like love and functionality like overcomes like just the dog fighting between men and women that is is inevitable for many of reasons um but <clears throat> i don't know if that's very profound but it uh is interesting to put it in the context of boys kids always worked or saw dad work for a very long time up until World War II and coming out of it it's like now dad's coming home at five o'clock and he's still a huge deal and we're gonna like aspirationally like paint him into a hero figure fast forward a generation of that it's like that's just a it's a whole different dynamic of dad not being around from eight to six and what do you do with it or how how has it changed culture or the family dynamics? And I, I think what's most interesting is like, this is all very recent. Like we only have like 50 years of this experiment and this art that we're analyzing is in the moment. It, it is our lives too, for sure. The way Ross, you father, the Matt, you father, like we're nine to five guys. And um, that is, something to grapple with that is um, still being figured out. That's an interesting, I guess I've never, I don't know why, I've never given significant thought to that idea that for how many millennia boys saw their dad's work and now they don't. Um, yeah. I feel like there's probably a lot to that, but just having, I don't feel like I've given it enough thought to like, unpack it very far yeah that that's sense. fair um and i think maybe if bringing it back like the point of these shows is a little bit like the dads are home there is housework as grandma tonoko taught us or talked about like you can do the housework and help out there and that's like even more important now because it's the only way for our kids to see us working right otherwise we're just slouches on the couch working outside the home all day expecting to rest and that's like that's not the message that is almost biologically ingrained to be sending like um to see dad working or helping or serving we've brought up like several dynamics and I know that one dynamic that I've heard some people, even like uh, people I respect, like I know Bishop Barron did like a whole um, video on like the Homer Simpson effect. And I think he's even used that in other talks and speeches, like the Homerization of like the modern man. It was if like TV did this to us, um, you know, whereas I, I think it, it does go both ways. Um, and he also, he, I think in the video that he did specifically about Homer Simpson, um, like he talked to, he kind of put this more in, in a context of this is like a, like a women's liberation. This is a like post-feminist change. Um, but yeah, I think there are a lot of different, like, I mean, it, there certainly could be a dynamic of that. Um, just with like Hollywood being more feminist and more egalitarian and not wanting you know, almost in a, a, a reaction to like the strong father figure being like, okay, well, let's have strong women and have the dads be the, the you know, the laughing stock. Um, but at the same time, like, I don't know if it's as simple as that, because I've heard a few different people kind of make that very straightforward critique as if that's the only dynamic here. But yeah, I think there are a lot of like very interesting historical 
as well as just like philosophical and cultural things that like created this reality and now like everyone loves Raymond and you know other shows are just kind of like reflecting it back so I did listen to that Baron video on the Homer Simpson effect Matt that you shared that talks about this um and he he identified the relevance of Nietzsche the dynamics of or the, just the question of is virtue a sum zero game essentially and you know with what he referenced with Nietzsche and how it sort of relates to the sum zero thing because I believe you guys correct me if I'm wrong but one person courageous here creates someone else uncourageous sure. over here right is that okay and what I think Baron sort of gets at in the Homer Simpson video that might be part of what the 1990s, 2000s Dopey Dad sitcom for shorthand gets at is that, yeah, there can only be one hero of the family. And for 50 years on television, it was the dad. And so now it's going to be my mom or the mom, right? Because articulating what the what the reality would be um, somehow between both of those or celebrating the virtue of both, right? Like, that's, that's admittedly more complicated, right? Like, how do you portray, you know, let's just say for simplicity, and I, I think most people say it's accurate enough, how do you portray the elegance the beauty, the femininity of the 1950s mom at the same time as the, you know, capable, intelligent, getting things done-ness of Deborah Brown, right? That's, that's a lot more complicated to portray both of those things at the same time. Now, at the same time, like, I mean, yeah, Deborah, I mean, she's very attractive, but, like, but... Did Ray like like how often did Ray ever like celebrate her beauty to put it to put it like very concisely? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean that's and this is if we have a theme of our podcast, I don't know, maybe or maybe my theme is like finding finding that right middle is like the most consistently challenge thing challenging thing to being in this life right like <laughs> to like okay here's here's a simple simple example right you have right now the <laughs> the craziness of the defund the fbi myth alongside the defund the police myth right like there is no way that reality is so simple is that yeah, those are clearly the answers, right? Like, that's that's just, that's insane, you would put it really simply, right? But finding the right middle, because both of them are responding to particular realities without finding the more complicated, nuanced truth that's, that's in the middle. I just had a, before we start to, I don't, I mean, when I kind of gave the example and then Mike talked about it from like the zero, the kind of zero sum game, like it's not just like I feel like that's something we all do. So I was I had this example pop into my head when Mike was talking about it. So me, Landon, and Matt are gonna golf here pretty soon. Okay, Mike, you've been invited and turned us down enough times. <laughs> and I'm not gonna win unless Ross loses. <laughs> but no, but like Matt's joking. But like okay, so Landon's much better than me and Matt. But me and Matt are pretty comparable. Ballpark. Matt's maybe slightly better than me, but not like another level better. Um. But, like, Matt also being bad makes me feel a little bit better when we golf. <laughs> and I know that sounds terrible, but, like, it's just true. Because if we're out there on the golf course and I'm the only one that sucks, like, you start to feel bad. And I'm not saying that I shouldn't watch Landon play and be like, yeah, I need to practice more. But in reality, when I see Matt hit a bad shot, too, it's kind of like, oh, I'm okay. And I feel like a lot of dads probably have the exact same thought, you know, watching these shows. Um, yeah. Anyway, that was just kind of a funny. I will. I will try very hard to root for Matt this weekend, but when he makes a bad shot, part of me is gonna be a little happy. <laughs> so there you go. 
But um, but I feel like also kind of based on what you guys had said, Matt or Mike, you were talking about how it's hard to portray, you know, this 1950s mom that's beautiful, put together, takes care of the kids in house, and you know, it's kind of the maybe kind of the more modern mom with a career and kind of keeping things together and it being in charge. I just think it's kind of interesting, like societally maybe, and maybe I'm going too far here, so you know, take me back if I am, but I feel like for women, we've kind of just added more to their plate. So it's like, yep, you're supposed to be put together and take care of the kids in house. And yep, you're also supposed to look really good while you do it, but you still have to do that. And then now you also are supposed to have a career and be smart. Not, not that they weren't smart before, be educated and, you know, be able to work up the ladder at work, but you're also still supposed to look good. And you're also still supposed to take care of the house and kids. Like we kind of have just kept adding things where I feel like to men, it's kind of like, and maybe it's a little bit of the, what Matt had referenced, kind of a response to having these strong male figures, you know, kind of put at the forefront of entertainment and life for so long. But I feel like it's harder to maybe explain societally. Like I know we as a group would probably have our strong opinions on what a man is supposed to do and a man is supposed to look like. But I feel like, as a culture, we've kind of deconstructed the role a little bit. Because if you start to provide, you know, if you say you you have to be the provider, you know, well that, you know, well that's, um, you can't say that anymore, you know, because that's not the man's job anymore. Or I you know you could just keep going down the list of more traditional, traditionally masculine roles, and I feel like those have kind of been taken away from being uniquely mm-hmm. masculine, I guess. So I feel like. In some ways, not to defend the dopiness of Ray, um, but I feel like we don't have a strong model. Like we haven't, dis- we have, we don't have a strong cultural model of what a man is supposed to look like. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's a good point. Who would be the closest one? Well, okay, I'm, don't podcast scared here, but. <laughs> And th- this is not an end-all, be-all, but I think it is something to this. But I think President Trump has occupied some of that space as a certain masculine archetype. In in yeah, in in terms of explain that more because my first thought was I don't buy it. So give me some. Well, more. in turn in well in, in, in an archetype, right? Uh, with with his demeanor, you know, just speaking observationally right because to put it just a very simple narrative and of course this isn't say like oh anyone who votes for trump is like thinking this way no no it's just it is it's a certain certain um social social dynamic going on there and the answer that like yeah masculine role right because because in in fairness to president trump you know he did observe stuff going on in the hearts and minds of a lot of people and and so rather than you know with respect to obviously republicans since that's the side that he's working on um instead of just being quiet and muted about it like politicians had been for some years rightly or wrongly he's he was loud about it in the most like loud way possible, right? And which spoke very much to certain like masculine qualities, right? Just being being loud, right? And being standing up for what you believe in, right? Regardless of believing whether that's right or wrong, how he went about different things, right? There is a certain like just objective reality to that sort of dynamic yeah. going on there so but yeah. question tv shows somewhat any i would say like mainstream popular media were for pretty straightforward guys like who is there anything aspirational for us in mainstream media Tom Selleck on Blue Bloods. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Even that's like, that. I mean, Blue Bloods Prime was like six years ago. Yeah, I can't believe that show's still on. Must be like a soap opera by now. 
I was gonna make a joke. No, I should. Don't podcast scared. I was gonna say if if Donald Trump is our archetype for manliness, I'll take Ray Ramon any day of the week. <laughs> but um, Romano, Romano, sorry, Romano. Romano. But no, as far as current television, or or just like something mainstream enough. enough. Yeah, I. Maybe I'm that, I'm that far removed from the mainstream. I think. Yeah, I mean, I feel like nothing's come out except for superhero movies and, like, I don't know, a bunch of other random stuff that no one right. watches. I don't know. I, I'm yeah, having like, a hard time. I think, which, su- I mean, maybe superhero movies is kind of the answer. I feel it's like that's superhero, kind of but, like, idea. the only one I've seen is the Dark Knight trilogy. and That was, like, a thousand years ago, Grandpa. <laughs> Jeez. You know there's a new Batman out. But, like, that's all... <laughs> fairly garbage too um i mean it's it's also like business i don't know business magnets like i don't know elon musk jeff bezos and like those guys you wouldn't like look to for much virtue other than just like pure capitalism okay so maybe here's one thing going on there because it's like yeah christian bale in the dark knight for our older viewers <laughs> um <laughs> like there there's a lot of good qualities in there honestly in him right I and mean, i think we if we just thought a little bit about like honestly like sex really has very virtually no role in any of those films third one eh, sort of minimally but like they're not um, father figure like, does it, type things yeah, I mean they they're certainly not the whole package. They're they're no Hugh Jackman. Hugh's pretty but... good actually. Hugh's a good one. <laughs> yeah, but th- but there is there is a lot there in Batman and like what Ross said with like Tom Selleck and Blue Bloods. I like, I've watched this a fair amount of the show back in the day. It's like, man, yeah, there's a lot of solid stuff and you have millions of people watching that show. So what's the difference? I mean, if we're trying to calculate, like, the quantity of influence TV has on the formation of positive masculinity, um, I don't know. There's only one father knows best, and now there's, like, five or six plus 30 um, mother knows best and 40 you know what if you know you can fill in the blanks with other things but okay so what what are some things that you guys do in practical life to honor women specifically if they can be your wife or non-wife do or have done I mean, in regard, I think it's easiest to talk about Claire. Um, I mean, I so like getting her flowers is like, yeah, it's kind of like a cliche thing, but like she just really loves it. Like that makes her day, and will like, yeah, like she really appreciates um, that particular gesture. Um, even more so, because like they're like, like we'll have some discussions, kind of like akin to like the Deborah Ray like. Oh, I really wish you would do more of this. Or I really wish you would do more of that. Like on both sides, right? Just kind of like part of us, like still learning about each other and what are what's important to us in terms of running a house. But um, like as much as like that stuff kind of occupies the conversation, it's like yeah, really just the small things. Like and just being like, all right, I'm not gonna do whatever I wanted to do tonight, Claire. Like let's just go for a walk, you know, and just kind of the spontan uh, spontaneity. Uh, those are the things that like Claire really values, so like that's why I have thus far figured out how to honor her, um, you know, in, mm-hmm. in a way that's meaningful to her. Um, in terms of non-spouse, um, I mean, I do have like I think being a PT, like historically it was a very female-dominated profession. Um, now it's I would say much more evenly split, um, but there's still a lot more women in my workplace than there are men. Um, and we're working with like people who are really heavy <laughs> or like people who are potentially, you know, so like, um, I would say that is one thing I do look out for. Like if I see a male therapist kind of like with a heavy patient, 
I'm probably a lot less likely to be like on guard for if something bad's going to happen, <laughs> you know, but like if there's like, yeah, uh, a female therapist who's got a really heavy patient and they're doing something precarious, like I'm just going to keep an eye out like, okay. Or if, you know, they start, um, I mean, a number of like the women in our clinic will have like creepy old guys flirting with them, you know? And it's like, yeah, mm. I'm going to like, if there's one of those people I've heard about, like, I'm not going to go in the office and document. I'm just going to stand right there and, like, just be on my computer type. You know, mm -hmm. just because, like, yeah, creepy old yeah. dude, like, probably won't be creepy as creepy with, like, another dude around, you know? Um, hey, Matt, you're going to be one of those guys one day, too. <laughs> Some zero game, you know? Am I right? <laughs> Gosh, I hope not. Uh, but, uh, but, yeah, I would say those are, like, the things... Yeah, those are the things that kind of immediately. So, uh, obviously, you guys know. So, we have um, three kids. The oldest of which just turned six. Um, so, for the last several years, two years, we've had three children in the home, none in school. Um, so, that's quite a load for uh, my wife just to handle during the day. And, you know, trying to, you know, she's kind of running the house, if you will, as far as house duties and taking care of children and all of that. Um, so I try pretty hard in the evenings to, I guess, relieve her at times, like if she needs a break. Um, so like something we've done since we've had more kids, um, like, I don't know. And I mean, it's kind of sounds silly. Like I'm kind of in charge of kitchen cleanup and I know, um, she obviously cooks the meal and stuff, but you know, so she has right now she's had some issues with blood sugar and like exercise is good for her. So after dinner, like I send the kids to the playroom. And I used to would have just kind of play with them, but I send them to the playroom and they're supposed to clean it up. They don't do a very good job. Um, and like, I just handle like dishes, sweeping the floor, wiping that. Like I just do all that so she can go downstairs and exercise a little bit. Um, kind of just to give her a break from the kids. Um, and also just cause, um, she needs to do it for her health. But I feel like that's kind of a particular example, um, that I've tried to, that I've tried to work in. As far as the non, like, spousal women, I used to always try to, like, tell women, like, if, you know, hey, you look nice today or something, if they clearly did. I've kind of shied away from that, honestly, um, as of late, just because I feel like there's so much about, I just don't want, I just, i just being totally blunt, like, I don't know how what's going to be perceived by them. So I've kind of tried to stop doing that type of stuff as much, but, um, uh, yeah, so I don't know about that one as much. Yeah, Ross has actually been sued for sexual harassment. <laughs> he's that creepy old guy, and he's only 32. <laughs> yeah. No, my old perspective was just like, yeah, like, if you can tell that they intentionally put in extra effort for whatever reason, just say you look nice, right? And I wouldn't use the word pretty. I would just use the word nice or something. But because um, I was intentionally trying to not come off as creepy, but then I just feel like today it still might be perceived as creepy. So I've kind of shied away from that a little bit. Um the creepy old guy in the PT clinic, I'm also a PT, that's just, that's just a real thing. Um, so I remember, like, in the hospital, I, when I was, I feel like there were several times, like, I would kind of, yep, like, that patient was coming, because, yeah, PT is more, there was more women in my workplace, and it was like, yep, that's gonna be Ross's patient. Just, like, it's kind of as simple as that. Like, mm -hmm. I'll get that person. Because they're gonna make any, because all the women at the time were younger, so it's like, he's, they're gonna make all of them feel uncomfortable, so, um, yeah, there you go. I actually had one time an old woman make a comment to me that was, I'll say, inappropriate. And I remember thinking, like, oh, this is how the girls feel, like, all the time, probably. Um, and, yeah, because it was kind of a weird feeling. Landon, you can – did you have something honoring women? Honoring women? Yeah, I think I'd just classify, like, several of these as, like, the love languages, like quality time or acts of service. I think as it relates to these sitcoms we're analyzing – um, I think they kind of boil down into like anticipating acts of service. Like it's one thing to say like, go do the dishes and, you know, sweep the floors. It's another to like be able to know those things need to be done and just do them um, without being asked. And that kind of makes the household items a mutual responsibility. Um and then what Matt and Ross were saying, I think just 
you know, carving out quality time and recognizing when that um, needs to happen, needs to be given um, or shared is part of like the not being the dopey Ray Romano archetype. I'm going to real quick, I want to get this out because I know Mike, you're probably going to take this somewhere else, but I want to, I wanted to say this when I read the outline and stuff, I'm going to defend Ray just a little bit and don't podcast scared. Um, you're a hostile sexist. You're the hostile. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But so obviously I'm not going to go as far as the, the grandpa who told her that was woman's work in one of the other videos. I did see that. I was like, whoa, that. this show yeah. was... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying that. But, like, I thought of a couple examples, like, in our household that I could be perceived as the Ray, and it's like, I won't say there's absolutely nothing there, but there's also, like, a but. So, um, like, so in, like, in our family, so right now Julius... Um, she's home with the kids and so I'm at work during the day and there's a lot of things that I'll be honest like she's around the kids more than I am so she knows more about just some day like um, like I don't know one of the times the kids asked for a snack and I was after work and I was like I don't know Julie can they have a snack and it it sounds like a very Ray like oh, I don't know but can yeah. they have a snack but like I didn't know what type of snacks they had in the last hour like because it's about dinner time so like if she had just given them a snack like I wasn't going to if she hadn't I probably would give him something if that makes sense so like yeah or like when we pack for vacation a lot of times she'll pack the kids and maybe uh, yeah yeah maybe I could do more to help I'll admit it but I feel like the butt is like she also just like because I would be leave for work she's the one that like gets them ready every day so I just I like just from a straight practical standpoint like all of the I mean clothing that type of stuff she deals with that a significant amount more than me and a lot of times she packs for the trip while I'm at work. So, like, yes, a lot of times if we're going to go somewhere when I get off, she's already packed her and the kids a suitcase, and I'm just throwing mine together. So it's like, oh, just like um, Ray's wife did, she got the kids ready. Yep. But it was also like I wasn't in the ha- – like, I physically wasn't present to do so, which um, maybe that – I don't know if you could say there's an issue there. But um, So not, like, 100% defending Ray, but – I do feel like there's some things that it's almost like I feel like just I, I it's kind of this is maybe a response to the men didn't do enough for so long but some of the things are maybe a little bit more like yeah that's just a practical thing as opposed to a sluggard of a father and husband if that makes sense it it does it does fair enough that's my last point fair enough I hear you so I I think um, so Matt, you had posted a good article from Psychology Today. Why are women attracted to benevolent, benevolently sexist men? Um, and then I read, <clears throat> I went to the article links to three other articles. One is an actually published research article on the same topic. And there's one or two quotes from here which were quite striking to me that I wanted to uh, sort of color this honor conversation with. Okay, so this is straight from the introduction of this article published by Palin Gould, Tom Kupfer, published or available from Sage Journals online. Um... And I'll I'll just restate the title for this particular one, just for clarity. Benevolent sexism and mate preferences. Why do women prefer benevolent men despite recognizing that they can be undermining? Okay, so I'm going to jump ahead in the introduction to a couple of sentences, or one sentence that strikes me. Um, Hostile sexism encompasses overtly prejudiced attitudes whereas benevolent sexism involves subjectively positive attitudes, parentheses, like, quote, women should be cherished and protected by men, end quote, end parentheses. Chivalrous behaviors, so that is a benevolently sexist behavior, 
attempts to achieve intimacy with women. So if you want to be intimate with your wife in any way whatsoever, that's sexist. <laughs> okay? I'm just reading it like it is. Um, so it it's, it sort of just... Women hate up. intimacy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you disgust me. Of all times. I, I have no feelings for you. <laughs> um, so it... it sort of wants me to come at this honor thing from like just another angle or just adding some layers to it. It's like why speaking from like my experience like why do I want to honor women right so if if a woman by herself has a flat tire on the road and she's like waving her hands like whatever <laughs> Why, why am I inclined? No, no, that, that's a bad example. Let, let's just do a simple, like, door-holding scenario. Go with the flat tire one. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, <laughs> door, oh, yeah, Would I you like help door. a guy with a flat tire? I mean, if he's waving his hands, sure. That's why I quit the scenario, because <laughs> I think it'd be the I'd same hit him. Uh, Teach him a lesson. <laughs> no, with the girl in the door, I think it is a useful example, because holding the door for a girl, whether you are on a date with her or not, or if it's my mother or grandmother. If you hold the door for her because you think she can't lift it, like, yeah, that is sexist. Because statistically, it's very likely that she can lift that door. <laughs> right? But moving that door even though I know that she can carry it or move it, it's like, if she can't move it, like, that's... I, Like, that That would obviously... Well, a turn-off, if they're, like, a peer. With respect to, like, my mom, you know, it's like, that would be obviously not a turn-off, but it would be like, oh, gosh, like, my mom, what, what's wrong? Like, what's wrong with your health? That'd be, like, something wrong with that situation. But it's like you open the door. I, I'm trying to like put a fine point on this. Like, what what is that feeling? It's like you want you just want to celebrate their femininity. Like that sounds like really foofy, but that that's just like the most concise way to put it. I want to celebrate your femininity, and it's like a guy. Well, fifty percent of the time, I'll open the door for a guy. <laughs> Versus just, well, it's one of those things, difference between letting him go first, but or just like doing the arm extension, sort of straight arm, sort of 50-50 between those two things. Versus the woman, it's like, oh, okay, I'm going to take a step back and let, let her walk through the door first. Whether, yeah, she's 80 years old or, um, you know, 30 years old. Or, like, even eight years old. Yeah. I'm trying to think if that'd be appropriate. But, like, yeah, no, that still is definitely appropriate. Eight-year-old, eight-year-old girl. So, I don't know. How would you guys articulate? Like, what, how would you articulate that inclination to honor a woman in those small ways that we're talking about here? Because, yeah, I mean, I think we're all on the same page. We don't want to date or marry someone who's weak. Like, I can, I can vouch for all of your, your spouses they're all pretty strong, you know. They could they could hold their own in a dark alley if need be. <laughs> My wife has no upper body. <laughs> yeah, she I'm, will admit it immediately. That's yeah, not even me. They <laughs> cannot hold their own in their dark alley. Oh, God. Um, I'll tell them that. She would yeah. be terrified. Yeah, in a dark that's alley. very yeah, nice of you. You guys are but... helping our case. You're all benevolent sexist. Mike was podcasting scared there. He didn't know what somebody was listening was going to think. <laughs> <laughs> but to proceed with your point, yes. They can carry moderately heavy things and open a door. Yeah. Yes. No, no, she yeah. can open most doors. <laughs> most, most doors. I feel like, and I know this sounds funny, like, it's hard to articulate what is, like, just an, in my mind, is just a natural, obvious, yeah, commonsensical thing. It's like, like it's almost like, right knowledge. like, yeah, it's kind of like, you just do it, and it's not like, oh, my culture has imposed this upon me, it's like, no, no, like, you just do it. Um, so, I feel like with all people 
I don't know. I feel like just I'll use the word like charity. Like we're we should act with charity towards everyone, and who that person is, how well we know them, what our relationship with this M is, and even like yeah, our genetic makeup is going to impact how I act towards them. So I think that we should respect everybody, but kind of like uniquely to who they are in their circuit, like the circumstance. So for your question, how should we honor women? Like that would fit as, you know, we should honor them and their, the, you know, to talk foofy, like the greatness that they bring to society and their feminine and genius. And in a lot of ways, just that's going to be kind of like Matt said, in, in, a, in some circumstances, that's going to be taking on more physical roles simply because of biology. So even if it's not necessarily required, like you said, I understand that she can open a door, but that's like my attempt to show her that I respect her, if that makes yeah. sense. Um, because it's like, yes, this door is not a thousand pounds to where you can't lift it, but I'm trying to show you that I'm you know, attempting to take a role to, to show you respect, if that makes sense. Did you guys have anything else on um, how you would articulate the sort of dynamic of opening the door for a woman, like doing, doing her honor? How would you express that in a sentence? Perhaps, like, sacrifice might be, like, the easiest, like, the quickest, like, like reason as to why you do it. Um, sacrifice and then just, like, I don't know, conscientiousness. Like, I feel like that's a, a display of... I mean, obviously, like, everyone's called to make sacrifices in life for the good of others. Like, that's kind of the definition of what love is. Um, but, yeah, as in terms of, like, why doors and why not, um, you know, anything else, um, I suppose that much I don't know. I, I, I couldn't say. But basically, I just think there's something to be said for, like, sacrifice and um, and just being aware and, like, looking out for people that are particular... I don't know. I think they're particularly masculine things, like... I do wonder, like, in this... This isn't, like, intended to be, like, uh, a condescending... I know you guys, you guys just discuss it, but... Like, the, yeah, this is not intended to be condescending. It's just, like, an honest question. Like, in same-sex uh, unions, I'll say, it's like, how, like, what what plays itself out as the pattern, right? Because, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, with respect to things like holding doors or, I mean, just keep going back to the <laughs> holding doors thing. Yeah. But, or, that might... or just, like, small thing, like showing them that, yeah, like the flowers. It's like, okay, but there's like a there's there's a corollary to flowers, right? So maybe the example Claire might I don't know fill in the blank. Matt what would be the corollary to flowers she would do for you. Yeah, I mean, I feel like what you're getting at is love languages. Yeah, yeah, I guess you know. Guess so. But like, but at the same time, I feel like there are love language like love language is something that I think apply to everyone, right? So like, sure, yeah. regardless of genders. But I, I think. And to some degree, like, I think it's okay that there are arbitrary, th like, masculine and feminine um, courtesies that get handed down. You know, like, I think that's a pretty universal thing, that there's some arbitrary masculine and feminine thing. Like, in some cultures, like, men always prepare the meat and women always prepare the vegetables, right? In another culture, it could be the exact opposite. Like, there's still gendered roles. Um, and to some degree, they're arbitrary. But at the same time, like, that means something to that people, you know? And I don't know if that's inherently bad, I guess. So, like, opening doors is, like, a common one here. Or, um, like, well, I, another one I've heard is, like, a guy should be on the street side of the sidewalk. That's like a, I bet, you know. Oh yeah. I was thinking that exact same one. Yeah. So like, 
yeah, is it strictly necessary? Is it like, you know, but I don't know. It's a little arbitrary, but at the same time, if it, if that's like a culturally meaningful thing, which I think it's starting to become not uh, so much, at least with the sidewalk thing, um, you know, because that becomes tricky when your sidewalk's more dangerous than the street because of all the potholes and you've got a stroller and it's like, you know, whatever. But anyway. I think that's kind of, I mean, I think Matt kind of said it. Like, I think it kind of the root of it is there's a lot of kind of cultural things. And I think some things probably came from practical places, right? Like, I'm sure there's, I think I've heard with the sidewalk, something with like when mud gets splashed up or something like that. And a man might have a trench coat that goes lower. I don't know. There's like something like that actually might have come from just like a practical that made sense place. And then getting handed down, it might not be as applicable anymore. But kind of like you said i think there's something to be said for like that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad like you know to make the effort still even if it's not necessarily necessary um similar to opening a door or or whatnot um okay so on our uh, journey we've gone from explaining the chasm between father knows best and everybody loves raymond touched on nihilism exaggeration relevance wanting to be relevant we touched on what was our next question after that before practicals and honor well landon i think you went into home improvement and how that was like an intentional point of contrast to some of these other shows in actuality right we identified some of the differences between tim taylor and ray Brown. yeah i think there's similarities to be yeah. sure well with, in like in with fairness, their shortcomings yeah um right yeah in fairness it's like yeah i mean guys can be dopey in the ways that i mean ross just admitted you know uh <laughs> um yeah, and those things definitely happen, but it's yeah, it's a matter of like playing into it or not. Okay, and then we went through like practical sort of things that we feel obl- obliged we want to do um, to honor that thing. Maybe we're all you know, yeah, it's possible we're all just um, we're uh, what's what I'm looking for? Deluded, benevolent, sexist. Yeah, we're. <laughs> Well, you guys admitted being benevolent sexist. I would let my spouse handle herself in a dark alley. <laughs> I, was gonna, I actually feel like there's something to be said for that. Like, what's the alternative? You know what I mean? I don't know. Well, and that's – so it's funny you say that because actually one of the, the conclusions in that study about benevolent sexism, which I do think is like a pretty comical term, especially given this conclusion <laughs> – it's like but, a benevolent slaveholder. <laughs> well, well, they're like so. This is uh, so. There's a quote within a quote. So the quote directly from the article is the quote quote, and then the rest of it's just from the summary of the article mm-hmm. from a third party. Does that make sense? So okay, Psychology yeah. Today summarizes this thing. Whatever. So this is from Psychology Today. Quote: Given that having a kind and caring partner results in increased relationship satisfaction. And considering that having fulfilling relationships are important for well-being and happiness, then, and this is the quote directly from the article, it might not always be desirable to discourage women from preferring mates with benevolent gender attitudes. <laughs> but, like, but yeah, so it's the type of thing that, like, I feel like, it, like Ross mentioned, it's so common, or I don't know if common sense, that's, it's like, it's just very natural to us no. to, like, behave a certain way. Um and like after all of this, um, like deep dive into the the merits and demerits and morality and immorality of of treating genders as if they're different things, um, it's funny just like that. This is the conclusion. <laughs> like oh, <Yeah. laughs> like this was fine the whole time, and we can probably get over it. But um, I don't know how many people read that study, so they must not know about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it got rebutted. <laughs> um, okay, here, here's, here's what I got for a final uh, roundabout question here. Um, I want to go a little bit into the sort of 
imagery of uh, the father handing off his daughter metaphorically in marriage to uh, his son-in-law. Um, so we'll maybe do it here in a sort of ephemeral way. Let's say that uh, your your new let's let's say son-in-law, your son-in-law. Um, you learn at the same time as your spouse that your son-in-law is getting married. So he did not ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. What do you do? So they're they're not like actually getting married today. Like I just I just no not today no engaged. not today okay. yeah they're just engaged. I think I would talk to him about some of the similar things that we're saying here. Mm. Um, like I don't think I would outright say you can't marry my daughter, <laughs> but I think it would be worth a discussion of like some of the things we're saying here because no. like. I'll go on my soapbox for a second. Like, not only are the things we say, like, I feel like a lot of the things we're saying here are, like, we've kind of said, it's okay, right? It's not necessarily bad that there's these arbitrary gender rules. Fair. I think most people would agree with that. And I think, yes, like, absolutely recognizing that there is, has been a ton of abuse and, like, yes, if you watch Mad Men, those are terrible men and all that stuff. Like, there's also something to be said for not only are some of the not the Mad Men stuff. Sorry, that that was supposed to be a negative. But, like, some of the quote-unquote gender rules here we're talking about, like, in some ways I wouldn't say that they're not only okay. Like, I think they're actually good and important. So, um, yeah, I think that would actually be, like, I would view that as an opportunity to, like, talk to a young man about just how to be a better man and how that's actually really important. And I have a huge interest in it and in that he's marrying my daughter. Um because that's actually, no joke, kind of a fear of mine. My daughter's only four. And um, I thought about this. Like, I would be, like, I'm actually scared that she will end up marrying a mm. jackass. If yeah. that makes sense. Like, if I could hand her off to, like, what I would deem a good man. And I don't think, I, I mean, I'm not talking, like, oh, sitting on my deck with a shotgun, like, you know, like, but, like, if I, you know, if I could hand her off to, like, what I would deem as a good man, like, I think I would be okay saying like yeah they're gonna screw up make their mistakes learn to forgive each other blah 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 but like if i would have like if she told me she was engaged to a jackass for lack of a better word like that is one of my biggest fears in life um yeah so anyway i think that would definitely to answer your question sorry got off my soapbox to answer your question i wouldn't ban the marriage but that would actually be a sit down like, we're going to have a conversation. Okay. If he will not have the conversation, I will ban the marriage. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's... Dude, I was just thinking, like, what if he didn't... You know, what if he was kind of whatever, but, like, yeah. So, I, think that's I would a, tell my daughter she should not marry this man. Yeah. I would kick his ass, is what I would do. <laughs> Yeah, like, in all of our minds, eh, just to keep playing off it, sorry, maybe I'm, I, sh I already got off my soapbox, I'm back on it, but, like, in our minds, he would be receptive to the talk, right? Because right, yeah. he would then, we'd, he, would he'd take the rah-rah speech, but if he actually responded with, like, a, oh, I disagree, like, that would be, ugh. Yeah. Well, I, his worst nightmare. I think the more likely situation, if you were in this situation, is that he would say... Yeah, sure, I hear ya, and he'd act, and he'd effectively be lying. Like he really actually does. He 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 would he thinks sure. you're a sexist. He would say what he needs to say to yeah, marry exactly. your daughter. In which case, you gotta make things hotter. You gotta increase the temp. <laughs> I would kick his ass. I Literally <laughs> in that room, you got you got a pager to Julie. You're like increase the temp. And you just keep increasing the temp in that room. The door's locked. And eventually, he's j he just dies. And then you just walk, you walk, you walk over Goodness. his body. And you, and you look in Julie's eyes as you walk out of that room and say, won't have no problems with him anymore. <laughs> On complete second thought, not complete second thought, but just to add a layer to it, 
Um, and this is kind of, this is a serious note. I actually a lot of night like if I lay my like my daughter falls asleep and I'm in a room or something like I'll say a little prayer for her or something. A lot of times I actually will say like I pray that she knows her worth and won't accept anything less. And um, so I don't know. Part of me is like, man, I feel like that would kind of fall on me a little bit. Like if she was okay being treated in that way, like as her father, I feel like one of my biggest roles is to like show her how she's supposed to be treated, you know, by how I love her and how I love my wife. Um, man. So, ugh, that was a bigger question than you thought it was going to be Mike. Cause I think that would start asking a lot of yeah, questions no, about good. just the job that I did and stuff. I've got my, f- <laughs> I had my funny answer ready. I sort of forgot my C. Se- I think, you know, Ross and I were talking about this canoe, my, my canoe shirt, like aggravation and grudges are like definitely my thing. <laughs> and yeah, because I mean, like I just acknowledge with you, like I would definitely have a major problem with it if he did not ask for um, her hand in marriage. Um and yeah, the re- most re- if he were the kind of guy who would do that, yeah, him sort of like giving a yeah, yeah, saying what he sort of has to say, you know, to get through that that um, <laughs> that uh, that confrontation that comes to be. Um, like man, yeah, I would definitely struggle. It's like man, he's saying yes, but oh man, yeah, that'd be really hard. It would weigh on me the rest of my life, probably. Uh, <laughs> I say that jokingly, but I mean, I, I just know it. I know that it would. Um, so, one other thing I wanted to say like on this exact same point. Something that's, like, crossed my mind is, like, what's what's the meaning of that metaphor of handing off your daughter, like, physically in marriage at the wedding ceremony? And I think that it's this. Up to the point of marriage, I mean, I do think that it is the father's first, well, it's the father's responsibility to literally, if necessary, lay down his life for his daughter. I mean, yeah, his son too, sure, (laughs) as goofy as that sounds, but just like in a special way, like his daughter, right? Because you're recognizing something that is uniquely sacred about her being being female, right? So that she has the opportunity to continue doing these things in her life that you could not do because because you laid down her life for her. And then when you're handing her off to your soon-to-be son-in-law, it's like you're giving that responsibility like on to him. Right? That, okay, now it is your responsibility to, without hesitation or without too much hesitation, to lay down your life for her. And of course, it's like, you know, we can, of course, say, well, it's just not realistic that you're going to lay down your life physically for your spouse. Sure, yeah, that obviously doesn't happen a whole lot. But, like, really believing that and internalizing that like informs and influences all of those small metaphorical ways that like come up in the rest of your life right like why do we celebrate lent right to remind us of the suffering of christ right and because those 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 things echo echo metaphorically throughout throughout the rest of our life so um yeah hot room you know, box him, challenge him to a foot race where the earth is falling behind us. It's like you have to keep a certain pace or just you just fall into a black hole behind us. Those are some other opportunity strategies potentially to test his worth. (laughs) I would look him in the eye and hand him a sword. I'm also holding a sword. I'll say only one of us is walking out of here with her. Yeah. And if he picks it up, he can marry her. Oh, and you wouldn't pick it up? Of course. I've already got it in my hand, man. (laughs) And one thing thing I would say, because I guarantee you there's a lot of people out there who would, like, you know, be horrified by the way we're talking. 
But I think an interesting – so a conversation I had with a friend, uh, with one of Claire's friends. Um, so she's Mexican, and she mentioned just her – she would rather date a white guy because she saw that there's this sort of machismo dynamic in among Mexican men. So, right, so her dad had the first and last word on everything, right? Her dad made all the big decisions. Her mom always deferred to her dad. Um, her mom waited on her dad. Like, if he wanted a beer at a family party, she would get him one, and that would be, like, he would say, well, you know, she, she would tell him, to, or he would tell her to do it. She would, you know, it was kind of an expectation, right? And same thing with, like, her brother. We'd tell her, to, you know, and it was, that was just how they, their family operated, right? Um, just their cultural gender expectations. So she didn't like that, which, fair enough, right? You don't have to like that. Um, but I also just threw out to her, and I actually used, like, Ray Romano in, like, the 90s, like, dopey dad sitcom type as, like, well, this is, like, an alternative, right? So you can go from, like, guy who cares a lot and, ha like, wants his way, but you can also have guy who doesn't give a crap about anything and just wants to sit around and watch TV, you know, so like as, as much as like, yeah, you don't want to completely defer to your spouse and have them run their show. Um, you don't want to have them completely defer to you and be a total dope who has no desires in life, you know, um, and has no opinions about the way the family should be run. Um, so I would say similarly, like with the marriage stuff, it's like, I guess I'm going to err on the side of being the dad who wants the best for my daughter and really cares about that as opposed to the dad who just wants to get along with his future son-in-law. You know, because, like, that's kind of the alternative for people who would push back on, like, this, I, what I think a lot of people would think is, like, a cartoonish caricature shotgun, you know, hot room scenario. You know, but it's like, well, gosh, like, the alternative is just dopey dad. You know, I think the alternative yeah. is Ray Romano, who's just kind of like wishy-washy and, you know, doesn't have principles that that he stands by, you know? Yeah, but in this, I mean, I, I know you're not saying this, but I'm just saying it out loud so it's clear. It's like, yeah, we're obviously not celebrating this, uh, your Hispanic friend's father, who's sure. not yeah, going to go get not. his own beer. Um. Yeah, we're advocating for you going to get your own beer and then asking your spouse, like, oh, you know, do you do you need a beer or do you want, you know, what whatever? It's like that's Yeah, that's that's really what and yeah, why is that not everywhere, you know, but yeah, that's the the ideal middle, if you will. Or even beyond like the ideal middle, I think it's I mean, maybe in an, that family the mom gets the beers, but then the dad does something else. Sure. You yeah. know what I mean? So like it's, it's yeah. yeah, I would say beyond, uh, beyond the particularities, it's just like genders sacrifice for each other and they like, you know, so they this, sacrifice this wholeheartedly reminds, and that's, that's how it should go. This reminds me of something from the sermon at your wedding, right? What was, what was, Oh, from Paul, what what was the exact line? Like, I, outdo each other with honor, or f you remember that? Um, to be honest, I I can't remember the exact Bible verse. Um, I should. That would be actually a good thing to. But to yeah, I mean that's keep. That's, but that's the um, but yeah, I know. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, that Father Father Joe kind of used that as his homily because Claire and I are both very competitive people <laughs> in other things. Um, and we try to be competitive in that as best we can. But yeah, like uh, yeah, no, I think that's that's kind of at the heart. Like, you know, whatever like that looks like, just sacrifice for each other. Landon, <laughs> son-in-law. <laughs> oh my gosh, what would you do if your son-in-law doesn't ask for your daughter's hand in marriage? <laughs> <clears throat> I chimed in. I think it'd be, um, I mean, I think it'd be a similar conversation to what we're having here. You, I, I think the harder you would press, the less successful the outcome. Um, whatever level of 
respect or just like character evaluation you would try to understand as a part of this asking ritual I think would not be accomplished in one meeting but maybe mm. a couple and yeah so long as you like felt comfortable with them I kind of feel like that explicit tradition will have died off in 20 years so maybe not though like maybe you you know over the courses of the half a dozen to a dozen times you hang out with them before that would come up you I don't know clear yeah make it clear I don't don't know if intimidates the right word but just like project project your traditionalist vibes (laughs) Yeah, all right. Intimidate. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with intimidate. Like, I think the projection that someone like Ross Landon, would would put off, Landon, like, someone's going to ask him to marry his daughter, right? Landon like, gets best out compliment his, I've had in years. Right? Like, you're not just going to go marry Ross's daughter. You're going to ask him just based on who he is. So, I don't, I don't think you'll have to worry about it. Landon gets out his golf clubs. Matt gets out the squat rack. <laughs> I I oh, take I him. Now. Did I, tell I you take that? I take him to a local rock wall. That's incredibly intimidating. Like if you're some fifty year old guy and you take a kid golfing, you beat him by twenty strokes. Like you're gonna let an old man beat you at golf. And Ross Ross is gonna read him Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a great show. What we got going on uh, in three weeks? It's Landon's turn. Landon? Larry? Wait, what's my name? Larry? (laughs) We'll let you know. I've been traveling. It's been a great show. Thanks for listening, folks. And thanks for drinking. And thinking. With us. Who will lead us to a better place? Well, Ross, you and I had a canoe trip recently. Mm. It all started. I've always wanted to go on a backpacking trip. So I've done a lot of camping and stuff, but never like <clears throat> anything intense or remote or backpacking or anything like that. So I wanted to go on a backpacking trip. So I started, I mean, with the amount of kids that I have, I decided that, you know, a four day trip to Colorado just wasn't going to happen. So I started researching backpacking in the Midwest and came upon the Ozark Trail. And it sounded like just what I was looking or thinking of. So, of course, I texted Mike. Uh, and, of course, he's done most of or all of the Ozark Trail. Um, so we were going to do a backpacking trip. But due to in pretty significant heat, we decided to switch to canoe trip. Uh, mm-hmm. So I dr- It would have been so hot. Ross would have died. I was expecting an all-inclusive backpacking trip where Mike carried my backpack. <laughs> um, I still might have died. It was pretty hot. Um, but, no. So, I went down to Mike's place um, Thursday night. We podcasted. It was great. We woke that up. Episode that is episode available. is available. Oh, it's That up? episode recently is available. recently available. Whoa. Yep. Uh, let's see. Woke up. I didn't realize how early we were going to wake up. 4.15. Um, and drove down to, into Missouri, into the Ozarks for my first canoe backpacking trip um except there was no backpack involved well, although I, you did I'll bring say one i brought one i'll say <laughs> canoe camping trip sorry i yeah um i had a backpack in the canoe but yes canoe camping trip no it was fantastic um it was hot probably gosh what was it like 96 degrees or something oh it was over 100 over degrees. 100 degrees yeah. um but no i'd never done a canoe camping trip so Loaded all of our gear up. We had two coolers, um, lots of gear, a lot of stuff fit in the canoe. <laughs> I actually wasn't. So I much. wasn't convinced when we got started loading it that we were actually gonna make it, and I thought we were gonna have to like tip <laughs> tip the van driver to take some stuff back for us. Um, but I mean, it was fantastic. Clear water, um, rock bottom river, 
moving at a nice pace, um, jumping in every hour or two to cool off, uh, cliff jumping. I wasn't the biggest fan of the cliff jumping. Um, I've never seen anyone less of a fan of cliff jumping. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that seems... I jumped off one cliff. I didn't really enjoy it, so I was like, why am I going to jump off more cliffs? Um, Usually, whoever I bring, I'm like poking them in the back with a spear to get over the edge of something big and tough, but I didn't feel like Ross would be receptive. How, to that, um, so I just what are we it. talking, 15 feet, 25 feet? <laughs> Mine was like 10. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I think 10 Yours probably, probably got up to 20 or 25 um, feet. Yeah, 25, i think I was guessing 25. Of, um, yeah. I think I've done 15 feet before, and, like, that's that's a extra... Not even worth mentioning. That's an extra like, half a heartbeat in the air that your stomach drops, for sure. I don't know. It just... It wasn't awful. I just was like, I didn't find it enjoyable. Anyway, away from the cliff jumping. Um, so we did some nice canoeing. I'll admit I was slightly humbled. I've had a canoe on Illinois rivers before, but uh, they're a little slower moving than the current river. So I don't think like I don't think I looked like a complete idiot, but I definitely didn't look great when I was in the back. I gave I believe I gave you a B minus or B. Mm-hmm. I think B was fair. I think throwing the minus in is just kind of rude. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on my mood. Okay, so a nice B. Um, but no, it was, I think my favorite part was when we just hang out. Uh, on the second day, we just took a break, popped our camp chairs right in the river, sipping on a Jameson and ginger ale and watching the boats float by. That was real nice. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. The camping spot was great. Um. Yeah, all around it was a great trip. It was it was fast. We I feel like with the drives both days, like three was it just shy of three hours and the... a little less. Than I mean, three it was just hours, a yeah. packed trip, but it was good. Um, the caves were nice. Spring fed river, nice and cool. Yeah, I was. Um, I would like to do it again someday. So nice. Probably highlight was either we got to explore a cave, which was pretty cool. Um. It might have been watching Mike's internal conflict at having harassed people for breaking the rules and then later <laughs> breaking the rules himself. <laughs> I I was grandfathering you. In. <laughs> um, no, the I definitely enjoyed the cave and the just sitting in the water, sipping on a drink, just letting, just living life slow for a little bit. That was nice. Um, so great trip. 